Good morning, everyone. Come on, let's stand. Worship the one who saves. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. signs and wonder I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven oh my praise belongs to you forever let's sing this chorus come on this is my testimony from dead to life cause grace we story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come on, sing it out. Come together, sons and daughters. Walk with blood and washed in water. has done something good in your life. Come on, how many of you have something way down deep? Maybe you've been hiding it, but you have something to say because Jesus has done something in you. Can we just give him one more hand clap of praise and say thank you, Jesus, for the story? Amen, amen. Have a seat just for a second. I wanna tell you just a couple of things that are going on. I'm Pastor Ryan, if you don't know, 
And we do something every year, and that is this. We support a mission trip to Lynch, Kentucky. And if, you, if you've been here less than 12 months, you may not have heard about Lynch, Kentucky, but it's an underprivileged town in Kentucky that years ago, God put on the heart of the Bridge Church to go and support once a year. And so we send a team out once a year. Now, if, if you've been here longer than a year, you, you've heard about this. And one of the things that we do as supporting churches of the Bridge is we give out bags just like this as we're preparing to go to Lynch, Kentucky. And we're gonna be doing this for the next couple of weeks. You're gonna get one as you leave the church service today, every family. And on here is a list of things that you can stuff in this bag that's gonna help a school that's underprivileged in Lynch, Kentucky. Uh, Things like four single subject notebooks. Some of you are like, we just got done with school. Why am I already getting a, a list of things to buy? Uh, a pencil case, a box of 24 colored pencils. You know something that's easy for your family to do is very difficult for some of these families in Lynch, Kentucky. And so we have the opportunity not only to support them like we do through your generous giving, but also as a congregation to fill these bags up. And they're actually gonna be taking these to Lynch, Kentucky and distributing to these kids. Amen. This, this is what a great thing for us to be able to do. So you're gonna be getting a bag like this when you leave the church service. Bring it back in the next couple of weeks. We're going to have them in the uh, lobby um, and we're just going to sit them there so you can see them every time you walk in and say, oh man, I forgot to fill my bag. Or, oh, I've already done. There's my bag right there. And we're going to represent the Bridge Goldsboro well. And more so than that, we're going to build the kingdom of God through such an act of kindness uh, for those kids in Lynch, Kentucky. Give me a big amen. 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 We're going to do that together. Um, If you are here for the very first time, thank you so much for being here. We, we honor our guests here, and my, here's your cordial invitation to come back next week because you know what? Not only is the service gonna be good, but you're not gonna be just a guest anymore. You're gonna be family. But today, we wanna say thank you so much for being here. You are our VIP, and after the service today, we have a guest gathering, and this is for if you're new for the first time today or if you're new-ish. I'm not gonna put a date on that, but if you maybe have been coming for a little while and you're like, hey, I would love to meet some of the staff, we do this guest gathering once a month and it's right out here in the lobby as you leave today, you're gonna see some tables set up and our staff's gonna be there and we're just here to say hello, not take too much of your time, but to put a face with the name uh, and if there's any questions you have or you wanna get connected in the church in some sort of way, we're, we're here to help you to do that. And so take advantage of that today. Uh, we we ha- have a really, really good snack for you. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but I promise you, you, you're going to eat it. And as some people have said in the South, you might slap your mom. Have you, have you heard that? And I don't know if you guys are PCS in from some other state, you're like, what in the world are they talking about? Uh, it's so good. It makes you want to slap your mother. I don't know if that's true. All I'm saying is when you eat the snack, make sure your mom's not around. Okay. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here today. Uh, I want you to stand back up to your feet. We're going to be worshiping together as the team leads us. Come on, let's serve our God.
worship was that? Come on, let's sing it. Your body was broken for my sake. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, that's all we need is you. God, help us not to forget that. Whatever we are going through, whatever and wherever our mind is at, it could be a million miles away, but help us not to forget if we keep our mind upon you, we are gonna be where you want us to be. Lord, I pray that you would bless this service. God, help us to get all of it out of it, that you would want us to hear Lord, touch our minds and our hearts. Lord, to stop what we're doing and just give you our full attention. Lord, you deserve the praise. You deserve the honor. You are worthy to be praised. And God, we just thank you for letting us be here another day and giving you, Lord, all the praise. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this service and help us just to do your will and go forth. And we ask this in your name. Amen.
Hey, welcome to everybody who's here on site. Welcome everybody who's watching online. So glad you're here with us today. And if you're here, you've picked a great day to come to church. If you're new here, especially, you picked a great day to come because we we're starting this new series today called The Journey. And we're walking through the book of Joshua. It's a book in the Old Testament. And we're talking about some of the stories that we pull from the book of Joshua. And not only are we learning about that, but like everything we do in God's word, we should be pulling out what God wants to say to us today. Because God's word is not just a collection of stories, but it is alive. And we should use it in our lives to see what God is wanting to say and speak through us today. Do you believe that? I just, I don't know why I'm stopping right here. But God's word can help you today. Whatever it is that you brought in here with you today, whatever situation that you're facing, whatever hardship, whatever joy, whether it's a mountaintop experience that you're just like, hey, nothing can stop us now. Or if you're in the lowest of lows going, I don't even know what I'm gonna do, but I'm putting on a face for everybody today. That may, you're gonna fall in that category in one of those two places or somewhere in between God's word is alive for you today and he wants to say something to you today. Let me get a good amen from that. If you believe it, open your heart. And so before we start, I wanna catch you up on a little history that led up to the book of Joshua so that we're all on the same page whenever we start. So for over 400 years, I know that sounds like a long time, but it's crazy. For over 400 years, God's people, which eventually became the Israelites, they were in Egypt. And they started out being there, everything was good, but eventually they became slaves. There's a whole story involved there. And they cried out to God for over 400 years. Ultimately, God delivered them. Who did he send? Do you remember? He sent a man named Moses. Let my people go. You remember the old uh, Ten Commandments movie? And so Moses comes and Moses delivers these people from Israel, or excuse me, from Egypt. And not only did he bring them out of slavery, but he was leading them to a promised land that God had promised to that people generations before through to a man named Abraham. And so generations later, they're in Egypt, they're in slavery, 400 years go by. Moses delivers them out of captivity through some miracles that God did through him. And he's, he's taking them to this land that is modern day Israel. And so they're traveling to this land, this promised land land. And they spend 40 years in the desert. Uh, And there's a whole story around why they did that. But during that time, God gives them the law that we have in the Old Testament. Uh, God does miracles through Moses. God establishes the fact that he's their God and they're his people. Um, And after 40 years, they eventually get to the place, the border of, of Israel, this promised land that God has been telling them through all these generations that he's gonna take them to. And they finally get there. And the the thing that happens right when they get there is Moses dies. And that a, isn't it, the Bible's juicy. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, uh, if you'll read it and, 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 and digest it, you're like, man, this is pretty nuts. This is crazier than some of the things I see on Law and Order, you know? And so Moses dies and Joshua is established as the new leader who's going to lead the millions of Jews across the Jordan River, which is the border, into this promised land. And this is where the book of Joshua starts. Now, this land uh, is inhabited, it's not empty. They don't just walk in and say, hey, we're home. It's inhabited by people, millions of people. It's inhabited by cities. And these are people that do not honor God. These are people that, uh, that don't love God. In fact, many of them probably don't know who he is. And God is giving the land to Israel, but he's saying, you're gonna have to go in and you're gonna have to fight for it. Isn't that interesting that the, the greatest blessings that God gives us, and it's still true today, still take work. Some, some of you are asking God for some breakthrough in your life. Maybe it's a financial breakthrough, uh, but it's still gonna depend on you to discipline yourself to live by a budget. I know I'm hitting some strings this morning. It's super early. Pastor Ryan, you've been going five minutes and you're already getting on my, on my case. And you're gonna have to start living within your means. I mean, God rarely, the, the greatest blessings of God aren't something that he simply gives you. It's something he transforms you into being able to handle well. That was a mouthful right there. I hope you get that. But he said the same thing to Israel. I'm giving you this land. This is a land he described as flowing with milk and honey. He described it in the Bible. And, and to them, man, that was like paradise. He said, but you're gonna have to go in and you're gonna have to fight for it. Now, here's the kicker. Israel doesn't have the numbers. They don't have the ammunition. They didn't have guns back then, but they just go with me. They, they didn't have, they were outgunned and outnumbered on every front. Their army wasn't big enough. And God said this because he said, by the time you go in and take the land and, 
and, and this miracle happens, you're gonna know it's me because you don't have what it takes to do it yourself. Doesn't that sound just like God? He sends us into places, he sends us into atmospheres, he surrounds us with things and sometimes circumstances that make us go, Lord, I don't know how to do this myself. And that's the time that God says, this is how you're gonna know it's me because I am bigger than anything in your life and I want to put you in this position so you learn to depend on me. How many times do we go in situations and, and we get arrogant because we can handle it? You, you don't grow your faith in places that you can handle. You grow your faith in places that you desperately need God and you cry out to him. It's like that song we sang, Lord, I need you every day. My God, I need you. You're the reason, you're the reason, you're the reason. And Israel's going into this promised land going, God, if we take it, it's gonna be because you are the reason. So they camp out on the other side of the Jordan River. They're here. Moses is dead. Joshua's leading. And they're looking at the landscape. And they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. And Joshua decides to send two spies into the land to do some recon, figure out what the best next move is, and then come back and, and tell them what they what they found, report back. And that's the story that I want to camp out on today, is these two spies going into this new land and figuring out what in the world they're gonna do. Now in this story, we're gonna meet an unlikely hero. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't know who it is. You might, thought, you might have thought you knew who it was, but you don't. And the reason is because you, you think the unlikely hero is gonna be one of these spies. Or you think it's gonna be somebody back home in Israel praying, or back in the camp, praying for these two spies. You think it's gonna be somebody's grandma. You think it's gonna be somebody that's, that's lifting these two guys up. Maybe even you think it's Joshua, but it's not. In fact, the unlikely hero in this story is a woman from Jericho, which is the city that they're actually going to attack first. Her name is Rahab. She's the unlikely hero. She's the underdog. Now, you might be thinking, why in the world is she the underdog hero in this story? She's the enemy. <laughs> she, she represents the, the, the godless city that Israel's coming in to take over. Shouldn't the hero of the story be one of the Israelites? Well, maybe. But the reason I love this story, and maybe you can identify, I know I can, is because it emphasizes God's mercy and God's grace to somebody that desperately needs it. We can really put ourselves in this story. And this is really my challenge to you today. Needing to be saved, needing God's grace and God's mercy in some, some way. Because ultimately in our lives, we're the underdog. I know some of you right now, can say, I wouldn't even be alive if it hadn't have been for God's grace and mercy. Some of the things that I've been through, some of the things that I've, I've allowed to happen in my life, I should have been dead a long time ago. It's only because of God's grace and God's mercy. We, and we're, we love the underdog story. I mean, if you watch the movies, man, how many of you just love Rocky Balboa? who wasn't even supposed to be on the bill. And they got him to thought, well, we'll just, we'll just get this, this scrawny guy. And he comes in, wasn't even supposed to last the second round. And he gets in there with Apollo Creed and goes all rounds and it's a tie and everybody goes nuts. And the underdog, heart of a lion story is born, right? We all, we all love the underdog story. It's somebody that's not deserving, but yet they end up doing something great. It's us in God's kingdom, not deserving of his love and his mercy, but still God sees fit to do something great in us. And so as we walk through this story, I want you to put yourself in it because we can identify, okay? So there, there's three elements to every underdog story that I wanna walk with you through today. And I want, as we go through them, I wanna read about Rahab and these two spies. Here's the first element to every underdog story is a hopeless beginning. It never starts out good. It always starts out like there's no way we're gonna be able to do this. And so Joshua, Joshua recruits the two spies and he sends them out to scout the land. Look at verse one in chapter two. He tells them, go, look over the land, especially Jericho. So they went and they entered the house of a prostitute. I said it was juicy. Named Rahab. And they didn't look at it and say, well, we probably shouldn't stay here. It said they stayed there. Now, doesn't that seem like the wrong place you should start whenever you're on a mission from God? I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty hopeless beginning. We're all thinking the same thing. That's the kind of place you should avoid, not start. And there's two things I want, you, I want to tell you about this. First, Jericho had a high fortified wall around it. And this was very common for cities back in the day because it was security. And they would put a high wall. Some of the walls were so thick that you could actually drive chariots on top of them. And they would station garrisons up there to be able to look and see if enemies were coming. War was very common back then. And so walls around cities were very common. And so 
verse 15 says that Rahab's house was built into the wall. So she had an apartment or some sort of house that, was, that shared a wall with the exterior wall of the city. And so there would have been a window on the outside of it. And so they may not have known what window they were climbing into. They just knew there was a big wall around it. And hey, here's a window. Let's, let's jump into it. Um, they didn't know whose it was. They just went through. So that's, that's the first thing you need to understand about how they got into the city. But the second thing I want you to understand was a little bit more about this hopeless beginning that Rahab had. The Bible very specifically says that she was a harlot. She was a prostitute. Now, there are some biblical scholars who have tried to sort of soften in that word and say that she was an innkeeper. Well, that's two completely different things, isn't it? Um, because they don't want to. They don't want to press that issue. Um, but there's no need to do that. She was a harlot. The Bible very specifically says that she was. She was a prostitute. You look at TV nowadays; it sort of glamorizes that term. Um, but it's probably the most terrible profession that there is. Not that they're terrible people, but the situation they find themselves in is terrible. There's a, a man that I know, uh, I've heard of him. In fact, it's, it's through uh, a very close friend of mine who is in ministry today, but he didn't always start out that way. He was actually hooked on drugs as a teenager. And he exhausted every avenue of income through family and friends and eventually still had to feed the addiction. And so he turned to sell in his own body. And thank God he's been drug-free for decades now and God has redeemed him and he's in ministry. And he talks about this story, but when he does, that's the most shameful part of his story is the fact that he sold, sold his body. There, there's nothing glamorous about it. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see about this story is there was nothing glamorous for Rahab. It was a shameful thing. And to show you just how hopeless the situation was, her, her name is in scripture five different times and every time the word prostitute or harlot is tied to her name, the redundancy is intentional. When, when you read the name Rahab, God wants you to see that hopeless beginning. He wants you to understand that she was a harlot. Why? Because a situation like Rahab's, God can magnify his grace and mercy in a life like that that he can't do so much in somebody else's. We all need God's grace and God's mercy. And when it happens for all of us, it's a miracle. Oh, but when we, as, as citizens of whatever city we live in, we look at somebody like that, we think, man, God can't do it for them. But God can take a situation like that, oh, and he can turn it around. He can still find a place, even though she has a hopeless beginning. She, he can still find a place for her in God's family. And maybe you feel a little hopeless. Maybe you feel like you've gone too far. Maybe you feel like, you know what, I'd, it's, I've done too much for God to love me. This story screams, no way. This story screams, God's, his grace is still for you. His grace is for sinners, don't you know? And the Bible says that we're all sinners. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. Say all. Now point to yourself and say all. We, every one of us, every one of us has sinned. And guess what? The Bible says we've fallen short of the glory of God. That means we've fallen short of what God's standard is. His standard is perfection, which he accomplished in Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why he sees us as worthy. But us by ourselves, we've fallen short of that standard because we've all sinned. So when it comes to, to natural sin, that sin nature that we all have, there's no difference between a preacher and a prostitute. Every one of us are worthy of hell. That's it but it's only because of Jesus Christ and the mercy that he has in our lives. None of us are worthy of heaven. We all need grace. And so back to the story, these two spies, they, they climb in the window and she accepts them into their home, into her house. And she hides them on the roof under some stalks of flax. And so they're hiding out there. And, and here's where it gets interesting. So the king of, of this place, he realizes that there's two spies. Word gets out that, hey, there's two foreigners here. And see, they had already heard about some of the things that, that God's people had done traveling through the wilderness and how they left Egypt. These were miraculous things. They had heard about it. And so when the king hears that, that two spies are here, he sends detectives over to Rahab's house. And Rahab looks at him and she basically says, they're not here. So they were here. She didn't deny that they were here, but she said they ran out of the city before the city gate closed for the night. So if you hurry up, you can catch them. And so they, what, what do the detectives do? They leave. And, and I got to thinking about this. Why would Rahab do that? This is her city. I don't know her origins, but she could have grown up there. This is her place. What kind of conversation does she have with these two spies? I mean, they're the ones in the vulnerable place. 
What kind of conversation did she have with them that at the end of it would make her think, I'm gonna abandon everything that I have and I'm gonna help, I'm gonna help you. And that leads me to the next part of an underdog story. It first starts out with a hopeless beginning, but the next element is a right commitment. A right commitment. Rahab decided that a commitment to the Lord was better than a commitment to the things that were familiar to her. Did you know that when your situation is dire, when your situation is hopeless, when your situation is to the point where you know that you don't have what it takes yourself, committing to the right thing is the precursor to success in your story. Committing to the right thing, as bad as it may hurt, it might mean committing to the right person and letting go of another person, but we're, we're holding on to the people in our lives that we know is gonna take us into the next part of our story that God has put there and making a commitment to them. It could be a commitment to the right set of thinking, right set of thoughts, right mindset. I used to think like this, but where did that leave me? So I'm going to abandon that and I'm gonna make the right commitment to the Lord. What does God's word say? Don't think about things that are worldly, but think about things that are lofty and good and holy. Think about things that actually press me forward into my relationship with God. Maybe it's a commitment to that for you. Maybe it's a commitment to do the right thing because you know God is leading you to, do, to make a certain step, to do what is right in his eyes. And you're going, you know what? That sounds good, Lord, but you know what? This isn't the wrong thing. Well, show me in the Bible where it says that I can't do. And we're sort of rationalizing, even though we know good and well, God is saying, I want you to take this step for me and further your, your journey with me. A commitment to the right thing. Many of you have seen Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Don't you love that movie? Walt Disney, way back in the day when they were making that movie, uh, it wasn't like it is today. Animators would have to actually draw every single picture. And Walt Disney was known for being ruthless, for cutting out whole sequences if it didn't go with the movie's flow. And so there's a, a particular animator who spent the greater part of a year working on a segment that would eventually be four and a half minutes in the movie. He spent, I think it was 240 days, something like that. And it was a scene where the dwarves make soup for, uh, for Snow White and they make a whole mess and the kitchen gets destroyed. And, and Walt Disney's looking at this after almost a year's work, worth of work and he realizes that this is hilarious, but it stops the flow of the movie. And so he just cut it. He just cut it. And can you imagine the animator? Can you imagine if you were that person that had worked that hard and that long on it? But, you know, Walt Disney understood that, hey, I'm making a commitment to the greater thing rather than someone's feelings. I'm making a commitment to the greater flow of the movie, the one that we all know today and love, rather than trying to get my, my feelings hurt or, or, or dig down into the weeds of something that ultimately doesn't matter in the long run. See, Rahab had a choice to make. Would she choose what was comfortable? Would she choose what she thought might make her happy for the moment? Or would she make the hard decision to commit to the right thing in order to see God do something greater in her life? It was the right commitment. Look at verse eight. It says, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and she said to him, I know the Lord has given you this land. That's a big statement. She said, there's a great fear of you that has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Remember that story? Moses holds up his staff and the whole Red Sea splits. Millions of, of Jews walk out on dry land. We heard what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan. Those were two battles they had before they got to the Jordan River whom you completely destroyed. We heard of it, we heard of it, and our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. And then she reveals the commitment. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She didn't just say, I'm scared, please save me. She said, I am making a declaration today and I'm committing to the fact that I believe your God is the real God. I believe the God of, of the Jews, your God, he's the real God. He's the God above heaven. He's the God that's, that's on earth. He's the real God. See, the people of Jericho heard the stories. They, they knew, but only Rahab was the one with the foresight to, to understand that the Lord himself was at work in it all. Where do you think that foresight came from? I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I believe it was the Holy Spirit leading her and guiding her even back in the, in the Old Testament. And there's, there's stories and there's, there's theology that you can dig into and you can see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all throughout the whole Bible. It permeates. Even David said, I, I have the Spirit of God in me. 
Where does all that foresight come? Is the Holy Spirit. Do you know that God is leading you to make the right commitment? Maybe even right now in this moment where you're struggling over something and you're hearing this word out of God's word and it's alive and it's, it's stirring something in you and the Holy Spirit that you have today because you've given your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible says he dwells in you, he's speaking to you. And he's telling you about this right commitment that you need to make. And it's God, he's the commitment. The right commitment precedes him doing a miracle in your life. And the question is, is will you make the right commitment today? And you know, sometimes that means letting go of what used to be and committing to what God is doing in your life now. Sometimes making the right commitment means letting go of something of the past, letting go of what used to be, and grabbing a hold of what God is doing now. Remember I told you that Moses died right before they went into the land? You know, there's a lot of people. Moses had led them for 40 years. He was, the, he was the hero that brought them out of Egypt. I imagine some of those people were a little bit scared when Moses died. They're probably asking, what are we gonna do now? What, who's gonna lead us? I'm, I'm sure some of them want to turn around and go back. Like we, we haven't known, you know, another leader. And Joshua became the leader. But when Moses died, they didn't know what they were gonna do. And they were probably holding on to the fact that Moses was dead. They grieved him for, for a little bit. But it's funny that God, whenever it starts out in, in chapter one, God looked at Joshua. And this is what the Bible says. You think that God was gonna give him this great plan. But the first thing he told him was, look, Moses is dead. You've grieved him, now I need you to let him go. And he said, I want you to get these people ready to cross over the Jordan into this land I promised them. Did you know that when people die, because we all do, God's promises are still alive? And that there are certain things in our lives that we need to regard as dead. Maybe it's a thing, an addiction. Maybe it's something that you've just been wrestling with and grappling with. And God is saying, you need to let that go and hold on to what I'm actually doing in your life that's gonna bring you into a new season. Sometimes making the right commitment means letting go of what was. It could be a hurt that you're, it's unhealed and you need to face that thing. You need to consider it dead in your life and walk through a healing process with God so that you can actually become the person that's gonna be patient and kind and joyful and loving and all these things that the Holy Spirit does in us. We turn into the kind of person that God's gonna have us to be to be able to hold the blessing that he's bringing us into. Sometimes God blessing you and that thing you've been praying for, it's not a matter of, of God's just not doing it. It's is you haven't gone through what he's asking you to go through to become the person that's gonna handle that thing well. And sometimes having the right commitment to go forward means letting go of what was and walking forward in what God is doing. Some things die in seasons through your life, but God's promises always stay alive. What do you need to let go of? What do you need to start committing to? so that God can continue his work in your life. Rahab had to let go of her life. She had to let go of her city. She had to let go of everything she loved and everything she knew and, and take hold of what God was getting ready to do. She even went as far as to make provision for her own family. Look at what verse 12 says. She looks at the spies and she says, now then please swear to me by the Lord. She already knew who the Lord was. She already declared and committed that your, your God is the God. She said, now swear to me by the Lord, you will show kindness to my family. Not just to herself, but my family too. Which that's really a sign of conversion, isn't it? That I'm not only concerned about myself, but I'm concerned about people I love as well. I wanna give of myself here. She says, because I've shown kindness to you. I want you to show kindness to my family. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them. I have no clue how many people that is. She said, and that you will save us from death. She's asking, don't just save me, but I want you to save everybody in my house too, everybody in my family. Can you imagine what her family probably thought about her having the profession that she did? I mean, it would, it would be close to say that they may have disowned her, that she hadn't talked to them in a long time. It's probably safe to say that they looked down on her. And here she is saying, I want you to save them because she made a right commitment. And she knew that if God can turn a harlot into a hero, <laughs> he can save my family. And I'm here today to tell you, if, if he can do that, he can take you and he can turn you into something great too. But it takes making a right commitment. And that leads us to the last thing that every underdog story has. And this is the biggest thing. 
This is overcoming the odds. This is what God can do in your life. He can overcome every odd that you face. You think, well, I do have a hopeless beginning, but if I make a commitment to him and really sell out like Rahab did, can God really do in my life what he did in hers? Can God really do in my life what he's done in the person on my row that I look down and I see, look, they look like they've got it all together and God's blessing them and, and, and their kids are good and holy and they're speaking in tongues in children's church and they come back in here and, and I don't, my kids don't do that. Can God really do it for me? Listen, there is not an odd in your life that God can't overcome if you make the right commitment and serve him. This is what the two spies said back to her in verse 17. They said, now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear, it's not gonna be binding on us unless when we enter the land, in other words, they're gonna go back and they're gonna, they're gonna rally troops and then they're gonna come in. When we come back in, this oath is not gonna be binding on us unless you've tied this scarlet cord in the window. Say scarlet cord. You know what, I guess it's a red, deep red, uh, almost, a, uh, almost a purplish because it's so deep red uh, cord. They said, you gotta hang this in the window through which you let us down. And unless you've brought your father and your mother and your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house and into the street, their blood's gonna be on their own heads and we're not responsible. But as for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell anybody what we're doing, then we're gonna be released from the oath you made us swear. She said, agreed. She, they said, let it be as you say. So she sent them away. And they departed, and what did she do? She went right away and tied that thing in the window. She said, I'm not wasting time. So these spies, they agree that when we come and we attack Jericho, if this, if this scarlet cord is tied to her window, we're gonna make sure everybody knows not to go in there, to leave them alone. Why do you suppose it was a scarlet cord? Why do you suppose it was a red cord that they said, hey, we want to make sure that you put this in your window, it's gonna be this color? Well, two reasons. One, I think it would be easily seen by them coming in. Anybody that saw it, they, it was easily seen. But there's a, there's a deeper meaning. There's a deeper symbolism. That scarlet color was symbolic of the blood of the Passover. Some of you know what Passover is. Some of you aren't as familiar with Passover. 40 years prior to this, right before they left Egypt, right before Moses let my people go, right? And he, he walked them out of, <laughs> out of Egypt. Right before he did that, they were preparing to leave and the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, didn't want him to go. And so God sent 10 plagues and it was a bad time in Egypt. And the very last plague that God sent, it was the thing that, that made Pharaoh go, okay, get out of here. It was all firstborn humans and animals were gonna die. You talk about, talk about tough. But God made a provision with the Jews and he said, if you put the blood of a perfect sacrificial lamb on the doorpost of all of your homes, then when that death angel comes by and starts, starts taking people, when he sees that blood, when he sees that scarlet color, that precious pure blood on the doorpost of your house, then he will pass over you. And so that's what happened. And there was great sadness in all of Egypt, but all the Jews that did this, their, their families were saved. And interestingly enough, this actually points to the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, thousands of years later, that when he died, his blood was shed, that precious blood. And what did it do? Just like at Passover, it saved those families. It saved us from, our, from death. It saved us from hell. Now when we call on and believe in the blood and the death of Jesus Christ, the Bible says we're saved from our sins and God sees not just our sins, not that, not that unworthiness because we couldn't meet that perfect standard, but it, because we're covered in that, we, he sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. And so all the way back at Passover, what was he doing? He was, he was, it was a symbolism that was pointing to the savior of Jesus Christ. And you know that the Jews still celebrate Passover to this day because God told them, I don't want you to forget what I did for you when you came out of Egypt. And so it's one of their feasts. They, they celebrate Passover, that time when, when that scarlet color, that blood, that pure blood was sacrificed and the death angel passed over your homes. That, that, that was still fresh on their minds. And when they said, I want you to put a scarlet cord in your window, they were saying the same God that saved us is gonna save you. It doesn't matter where we come from, where we've been, that same blood of Jesus Christ, it's still relevant, it's still precious, and it's still able to save you from your sins when we come in the name of Jesus Christ and say, God, we believe not that we're so good, but I come to you in the sacrifice of Jesus, his name, because his blood was shed for me. 
The Bible says if there is, uh, you can't have remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And God knew we couldn't do it because our blood's not perfect. We have sin in our lives. But he sent Jesus who lived perfectly, never sinned. And then he took our place and his blood was shed. And now when we come through him, the Bible says we're saved. And it's the same thing that happened to Rahab that day. God saved them. And it raises the question for us, are we under the blood? Are, are we saved? Do we, have we accepted Jesus' sacrifice for us? Are we in right relationship with him? I want you to contemplate that. I told you in the beginning, I want you to put yourself in this story. Are you satisfied just being a good person? You satisfied just saying, hey, I go to church or hey, I try to be a little better than I am bad. So God's certainly gonna weigh that and, and he'll see there's more good in my life. He'll see my heart. I'm a good natured person. Certainly better than the next average Joe or Jane. Certainly God will see that. But here's, here's the problem with that thinking that the Bible says none of us are good because the standard isn't good enough. His standard is perfection and God is perfect. And if you wanna get into a perfect heaven with a perfect God, then why would you ever stand at the gates and say, let me in if you're not perfect? If God lowered his standard of perfection, then he wouldn't be a God worth worshiping. He'd be like us. And God saw that. He saw the dilemma there. He said, hey, I have a perfect standard. I'm not changing who I am because I'm a holy God. But he loved you so much John 3, 16 says that for God so loved the world that what did he do? He sent his only son to die in our place that whoever now believes on him, they won't perish, but they'll have everlasting life. And so I asked that question again today. Are you under his blood? Are you covered by Jesus? And to answer that question, you have to answer this one. Have I accepted him? Because he makes a great promise. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him, say in him, Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. In him, what do we have? Salvation, redemption, through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins. I don't know if that's good news to you, but, but I, I can remember coming to God going, I've got, a, I've got a rap sheet. Some of the things I'm so embarrassed about, but Jesus, he covers that. Are you kidding me? He covers that. So God's gonna look at that and, and he's not gonna hold me accountable to that. So it says right here, we have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. God certainly doesn't condone sin, but when we come to him in repentance and turn and, and admit that he is Lord, yeah, he covers your sin. And he now sees you as worthy. It's not too late for you. It wasn't too late for Rahab, even though her life wasn't exactly what you'd call godly. Her life was in a hopeless kind of a state, but it's interesting because you say, well, what can God do with me now? Well, God can certainly do a lot with you now, just like he did with Rahab. He saved her very life and her family's life, but it's more than that. Did you know that when you leave this planet, you've got kids and family and a legacy to leave? You've got people that you're influencing now. And for Rahab, it's interesting. A thousand years later, we read in Matthew chapter one that Rahab ends up in the line and the lineage of guess who? Jesus the Christ, and she's mentioned there. And the Jews are really good at keeping records. <laughs> and if you read through uh, the book of Numbers, you'll see. And, and there it is in Matthew 1, the lineage of Jesus Christ, and, and there's Rahab in the lineage. Talk about a change in legacy. Then you go over to Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament where they're talking about the hall of faith, the hall of fame for people that had faith in the first church in the first century. They're looking at these people as like examples of what it is to have faith. And in verse 31, there's who? Rahab, what? And it's even there, the prostitute Rahab. I mean, like they knew. But they're exalting her because she had faith. And they're going, you know what? Even though she had a bad life and a hopeless beginning, God can certainly change it around. He can change your life around. Why? Because a hopeless beginning is no match for the hope of Jesus. And that's what God wants to do in you. He makes all things new. He did it for her. He can do it for you today. But just like Rahab, you have to choose him. She didn't have a history of being good. She didn't have a history of going to church service. She was a hero because of one act of faith. She chose the Lord. And I'm asking you today to choose him. And maybe if, if you're not saved today and if you don't know what that means, you haven't given your life to Jesus. He's not the one that's making the decisions in your life. 
Have you made him Lord of your life? And when I say Lord, like he has the authority in your life. You, you submit to him. You're reading the Bible for, your, for the answers for the next decisions you're gonna make. You're, you're falling on your face before him, singing songs like, Lord, I need you every day. Not just when things go bad, but you are the reason that I live and breathe. You've seen everything I do and, and still you love me. Do you have a relationship with him like that? Have you, do you, have you said he's your Lord like that? Then you're one decision away from that happening in your life, just like for her. And I wanna encourage you to make that decision today. Maybe for you, you're already saved. Maybe you've already made that decision. But did you know God is still asking you, as long as we're breathing air on the planet, to make acts of faith, to do things, to further in him? Why? Because you're not perfect. Raise your hand if you are. Yeah. Online, did you raise your hand? I didn't think so. Why? Because we're not perfect. So therefore, as long as we're breathing air on this earth, there's something God wants to do in us. There's a step of faith that we can take. And maybe for you, if you're a part of this church and you've been coming here a while, maybe your next step is getting involved serving. You know you're not serving. You know you're not involved. You know you're not serving unselfishly as you yourself are being served, which is part of our mission. We wanna connect, grow, and serve, and then lead other people to do those things. Serving is one of them. Have you decided to do that? Maybe getting involved in growth track or a bridge group. You're saying, hey, I wanna grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Is that your next act of faith? Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's, hey, I, I know I need to give. God's called us to be generous. It's all through the scriptures. And we, we do this together as a family. It's not something that I lord over you as a pastor. My goodness, I don't. I don't know what anybody gives around here. But I know this, that when we give together as a church body, not only are we blessed as people, but God's work gets done. Is that your next act of faith? Maybe it's baptism. Have you been baptized? Have you accepted Christ Jesus? And have you been water baptized? We have a baptism coming up at the end of July. I want you to go online and register for it if you haven't already. Find out about baptism. Check it on your connect card. They're right there in front of you. There's one online you can look at. Let us know. Maybe for you today, your, your next step of faith is choosing God and saying, I want you to be the Lord of my life. For everybody else, what is that next step of faith God's asking you to take? I wanna say a prayer over us, then we're gonna go. Lord, you've heard our hearts today. Lord, I, I love the fact that when we come into a service like this, Lord, your word gets preached from this platform, but Holy Spirit, you're having conversations with everybody in this room and watching online, everybody under the sound of my voice. You're having conversations with them because your word doesn't go out and you just sit back and watch it. Your word goes out and you get in it because you know us, you know every single person, every heart, and you're wanting to move in our lives. And God, we felt you move in our hearts. Can we just be honest? We felt you move, God. Help us to be quick to listen and quick to obey. Lord, for those that are watching online or right in this room that know they need to give their heart and their life to you today and say, be the Lord of my life. If that's you, I want you to take a bold step and just say, I choose you, Jesus. And pray this prayer with me and mean it in your heart. I believe that you are the son of God, Jesus. I believe that you came to this earth and lived a perfect life and died for me in my place. And not only that, but, but you raised up from the grave, victorious over death, and that you're in heaven today. So you have the authority in my life. I believe those things, but I don't just want you to be my savior. I want you to be my Lord. And as I walk out the rest of my days on this earth, lead me and guide me. I'm not perfect, but I'm gonna wake up every day and aim my heart at you, Jesus. And one day when I get to heaven, oh man, I'm gonna be able to say I wasn't good enough, but thank you, Jesus, that died in my place. There's an eternity waiting for me. For everybody else in this room and watching online that needs to take that next step of faith, whether it's baptism or whether it's giving or getting involved in a group or serving in some way, do that. God, help us to do it. Help us to not be spectators, observers, takers, but help us to get involved in your kingdom and what you're doing as we all reach the unity of the faith together and go like a family under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, Bridge family, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this message meant a lot to you and I hope it reached your heart as we learned about an unlikely hero today in the Bible. 
Continue on with us as we move forward in this journey through Joshua. We can't wait to see you next week. Love you guys.